Okay. Welcome uh, to this uh, to this session from the European School of Oncology. We are uh, happy that we have some time to talk and to discuss with the participants uh, about rare cancers in Europe and the population-based studies to measure indicators for centers of expertise. I'm your Maarten van der Slan and I'm a researcher at the Comprehensive Cancer Center uh, the Netherlands and next to me is sitting uh, Dr. Visser. Please introduce you. Hello, my name is Otto Visser and I'm uh, the head of the registry of the, the Netherlands Cancer Registry. Uh, unfortunately, our uh, colleague Sabine Sisling could not uh, attend this uh, session as a discussant, uh, but we expect that she is uh, following this uh, on, on screen. Okay, then we go to slide uh, four. Slide four, uh, we want to remind you that uh, it has questions and red arrow, arrow shows you uh, how to do this. start. Before uh, really going into depth about uh, centers of expertise, we included uh, a slide on what is a rare cancer. Um, rare cancers are based on uh, incidence. Uh, this is better for uh, cancers, for rare cancers, instead of prevalence, which is mainly used for rare diseases. The thresholds for rare uh, cancers are 6 per 100,000 per person year, and uh, it, we defined uh, about 226 uh, tumor entities. This was discussed with clinicians and uh, pathologists, and from these 226 types, 186 types are considered to be rare. Go to slide 6. Rare cancers burden in Europe. I think it's very important that we realize that per year in Europe about an estimation of 500,000 new cases are uh, diagnosed with a rare type of cancer. So this is quite a lot of uh, patients. Of this is actually 20% of all new malignancies uh, identified in the, in the cancer of all cancers. Uh, at this moment, which is also an important and impressive feature, about 4 million people are still alive, uh, ever being diagnosed with a rare type of cancer. This is 24% of all uh, total, uh, the total prevalence of all cancer types. Okay, we go now to slide 7. In a previous uh, project, uh, the rare cap project, uh, we calculated uh, the, the, the incidence numbers, the prevalence numbers, the survival numbers uh, for these rare cancers. And there we found uh, a, a real difference in the five-year relative survival for, uh, between rare cancers and common cancers. Actually, overall, already starting in the one year relative survival, we found a, quite a, a lower percentage, average percentage per year um, of survival, 10 to 12 percent lower survival per year. So we have to do something with this. We go to slide 8. What are the common problems in rare cancers? This is of course then the, uh, related, uh, expected to be related to the survival. Uh, common, com common problems in rare cancers are, well, late or incorrect diagnose, limited access to appropriate therapies and clinical expertise, limited information about the disease, and lack of clinical trials. How to tackle these problems? I have a question about the clinical trials. Why, why do you think that, uh, that there is a lack of clinical trials for, uh, for rare diseases? Well, at least uh, you need uh, enough cases to uh, set up a trial, and trials are always uh, uh, have, have a purpose uh, for finding a medication or something, and uh, therefore you need uh, enough cases to select 
if you have a spread uh, a number of cases in Europe, it is hard to collect these uh, data. So that, 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 that it would be important for uh, different centers that treat those kind of patients to collaborate and to have more patients in yeah. order to do research. Yeah, the, all the cases should come somewhere together. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, how to tackle these problems? And this is related to the question Otto just asked me. Um, mostly it is lack of knowledge and uh, how so how should we create this, uh, this knowledge? We think, and this was also discussed with other clinicians and patient uh, organizations, that where some uh, disease is rare, and in this case uh, cancers are rare, we should start networking between experts to share knowledge and to concentrate knowledge. Concentrating knowledge can be done in bringing the patients to one place, but concentrating knowledge is also to generate a network uh, between specialists, that they share this knowledge and that they come in this network together. USERT did an exercise for rare disease in comments, and this was an example for us for the RACANET project on how to work on the indicators for centers of expertise or uh, even important, uh, the same important uh, network of expertise. So what, we can, what did we do for uh, the RACANET pro pro project to start uh, uh, um, organizing a network of expertise? We brought together, on slide 10, uh, we brought together many parties because we are uh, convinced that if you want to set uh, criteria for centers of expertise, this must be done, be done in a multidisciplinary setting. All disciplines uh, involved with cancers should be involved also with setting these uh, indicators. And not only the disciplines, also the patients should have a voice in setting these indicators. What is their finding of importance for these centers? We, split, we have split this in two groups. We go to slide 11. We brought up general criteria uh, for all rare tumor types. And further we thought, okay, maybe we should set an example for some specific tumor types. And therefore we found specific criteria. These all developed and discussed with the, clinic, uh, with the clinicians, pathologists and the patient associations a multidisciplinary setting. If we uh, go to do, uh, slide 12, we will find the general criteria for centers of expertise on all rare diseases that were available. We did some research uh, in Europe on what is already available on uh, criteria for centers of expertise, networks of expertise on national level, on international level. Uh, we looked uh, 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 outside Europe and inside Europe. Uh, we found uh, most important the user, which I just mentioned it, with uh, criteria for uh, centers of expertise, criteria for centers of expertise on uh, rare diseases. Uh, and multidisciplinary scientific societies were uh, involved in some uh, described criteria for these centers. Patient organizations had a voice in this and uh, created some manuscripts on, on, on uh, rare cancers. And of course, it should also be uh, important by, uh, should be aware of the documents by the policymakers. A selection of all these criteria were adopted by the, uh, during the meeting with all uh, clinicians and the involved uh, patient organizations. We go to slide 13. We have different kinds of indicators that could identify the centers of expertise or even more, the, 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 uh, the networks of expertise. 
The first thing is the, attractive, the attractiveness measured through the volume of cases treated. These are the so-called volume indicators. Then, the capacity to produce and adhere, adhere the clinical guidelines, stating procedures, treatment. In this, we see that uh, guidelines should be leading to, uh, because most of them are uh, evidence-based uh, and um, that is some importance for uh, good clinical treatment. You might have a question about the, the, the clinical guidelines. Uh, the, the use of criteria says that a center of expertise should have the capacity to, to produce guidelines, but does that mean that all the centers of expertise should have their own guidelines? Uh, is that preferable, or do you have another opinion? Okay, no, um, it's a good question. Um, I, th I think you raise, raise a good point that it is not that every uh, center of every center of expertise or a uh, network of expertise should produce uh, clinical guidelines. However, they should be involved in producing uh, guidelines. They should put their effort in it. Uh, if you concentrate the knowledge with uh, with trials and with the uh, with with patients with treatment, then they should give the input in the uh, in the guidelines where the guidelines, in my opinion, should be on national or international level, because we should all work with the same guidelines. Okay, this that means instead of producing their own guidelines, they have to, to, to collaborate and produce guidelines with other experts on those fields. Exactly. Okay. And then at third, um, at, still at the slide 13, uh, we have some outcome indicators like surgical free margins, number of revisions uh, done, uh, recurrences. Well, those are all indicators that say something maybe on the quality of care and uh, can be uh, used for the criteria. Slide 14. In the discussion with the clinicians and the patient associations, we found also that the, uh, the, the criteria set by the users on multidisciplinary teams are considered very important. This is an indicator that says something on the internal organization of a hospital or a network. Uh, if we go to the fifth uh, criteria, this is about the collaboration with the other centers. I think this can be considered as a regional or a national or maybe even international organizational indicator. The sixth and the last is the capacity to participate in the data collection, clinical research and public health in relation to cancer registries. Because how to prove your expertise? I think it's very important that the centers of expertise have data of what, what they are doing and um, should they collect their own data or what, what's your opinion about who should collect the data? If you are a center of expertise or you are participating in a, in a, in a network of expertise, I think it's important that you make yourself responsible for uh, having uh, the data how you organize the collection of the data, I think uh, it's up to, to the, the center on how to do this. I think a perfect example are the cancer registries who are already having a lot of data and maybe they are the party to support these centers of expertise. Okay, thank you. We also have a, a question from the audience. It's from uh, Mihai uh, Georgescu uh, from Bucharest. Uh, and the question is, do you consider access to modern medical technology as a sense of expertise criteria? What do you think, Jan Maarten? Um, if I recall the discussion as we had uh, within the RACANET uh, project, I think um, that the access to modern medical technology can be a criteria, um, uh, but 
it, it's it's difficult to say how to work on this on an international uh, level. Do you have an opinion on this, uh, Otto? Well, I, I think that uh, if you are a center of expertise and you, it is known that uh, you need mo medical technology either for diagnostics or therapeutic reasons, then uh, the, the access to um, medical technology can be, a, can be a very good criterion. For, okay. for a center of expertise. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Mm, not yet. Okay. The questions are welcome. Now we go to uh, uh, slide 15. We just talked about common criteria for centers or networks on, of expertise for rare cancers or in this case even rare diseases. Um, if we, we also wanted to make an example to see if we can set specific criteria for centers on, of expertise for some specific tumors. So we selected the sarcomas who are having uh, some difficulties or where it is hard to, to set a proper diagnosis. There's a lot of delay for patients diagnosed with sarcomas. For the testicle, uh, testicular cancers, um, the more important thing is, as we found out in talking with the patients and the clinicians, is the follow-up. You get a treatment, which also should be done maybe in a center of, in a center of expertise, but uh, the follow-up should be, uh, is an important part of the testicular when having a testicular cancer. For the JAPNET, the neuroendocrine tumors, uh, we found it important that we have uh, the hormonal treatment and you need quite some expertise to uh, work with these hormonal treatments. Also, diagnose is somehow a problem for these type of rare cancers. The head and neck tumors are more related, in our opinion, to proper surgery and radiotherapy. Uh, it is for the sur surgeon, if you are uh, doing surgery in the head or neck uh, region, it's important to uh, do that as good as possible, not leaving scars, but remove the whole tumor. These uh, items were set in collaboration with the clinicians and also with the cancer registry because that is the source which we used to further uh, uh, investigate the reliability and, and, and to realize these indicators. Going to slide 16. How to define the criteria for, uh, for the indicators? We set some rules, and I think they are uh, quite common uh, used. An indicator should be valid, should be reliable, reveal differences, describe either structure, process, or outcome, influences the outcome of the patients, and uh, in our case, uh, the cancer registry should be able to obtain this data. Going to slide 17, we will find the rationale. Using the uh, items in slide 16 to slide 17, we found it important that um, we measure the expected differences in clinical ma management, expected differences in clinical outcome, find possible geographical patterns risk factors and trends in incidents. Uh, also, it uh, was useful that we somehow found already uh, existing criteria by uh, tumor-specific working groups uh, on interna international level and on national level. The other thing is that for our research, uh, you need a caseload, so you need some cases to calculate the indicators. So the tumors we uh, selected were rare, but not too rare. 
Here I end my part of the uh, presentation and I hand over the word to my colleague Otto Fischer. Okay, before going on I would like to stress again that participants can ask us questions. Uh, they can do that by sending us an email so that we can discuss their, uh, their problems and hope uh, we can get, uh, give them an answer. Uh, as I might already explained, uh, we have uh, de designed four high-resolution studies on uh, sarcoma, on testicular cancer, head and neck, and jet net. Um, if you go to slide 18, um, it is important that uh, when you develop indicators that they cover the whole patient pathway. So if you only have indicators uh, on, let's say, treatment, then you only cover a very small part of the pathway. So indicators that uh, describe centers of expertise should cover a diagnosis as well as treatment, as well as follow-up, in order to give a, a complete picture of, uh, of how a center of expertise works. Um, if you go to slide, eight, slide 19, uh, what kind of uh, examples can you imagine when you look at uh, indicators on uh, diagnosis? There are some examples on this slide. Uh, for example, you could uh, use imaging or diagnostics, stage or staging at pro a time of diagnosis, and what kind of uh, diagnostics were, do were done to uh, staging, uh, or only a biopsy, or uh, patient to uh, stage the patient. So all those kinds of investigations are part of a good diagnosis. The pathology, of course, is also a part of uh, a, a correct diagnosis. Um, uh, even if you have done pathology, uh, is then uh, the pathology report complete? Are all the aspects of the diagnosis mentioned in the pathology report? Or is the review being done? This is all, they are all important important part of a good diagnosis of a cancer patient. You can also look at uh, time, uh, uh, time periods, for example, between, between the time of diagnosis and the di di time of treatment or the time uh, of uh, first visit to a hospital and first in the time of the diagnosis. All those kind of time frames are part of a, a good uh, uh, diagnosis, a diagnostic process in a hospital. Slide 20 gives you some examples of indicators related to treatment. Um, of course, treatment is an essential part of uh, uh, quality of care of cancer patients because if you give the wrong treatment, then the patient probably will not survive its disease. Um, there are all kinds of aspects of treatments that we can, uh, can look at. And, uh, for example, you can look at referral patterns. Uh, is the treatment being done in the same hospital as in the hospital diagnosis? Um, when uh, diseases are very rare, then you expect that patients are being referred to another hospital where they are. That, in that way, uh, you can even have a good quality of care when you refer a patient to another, patient, to another hospital where they have more experience with their disease. Another as aspect of treatment can be that you look at the, at the margins after surgery. Preferably, the margins are free, of course, after the surgery. Um, but that is uh, sometimes a balance between uh, a mutilation of a patient when you have, uh, uh, do, do a very large uh, operation uh, or a, a more smaller operation with a, a risk of, uh, of perhaps uh, positive margins. You can also look at uh, time periods between, uh, for example, the first treatment and adjuvant chemotherapy or other adjuvant therapies. Slide 21 gives you some examples about uh, items um, on uh, follow-up that can be used as basis of uh, You can look at local recurrence, for example. The rates uh, are supposed to be as low as possible, of course. Uh, how high is the proportion of metastasis in patients that were treated? And, of course, at the end of uh, follow-up, you, you look uh, at uh, 
at uh, whether the patient is still alive or, or died, and has the patient died of the disease or sometimes products of another disease. If you go to the next slide, we want to recall once again that patients can, uh, uh, can ask questions. Ah, we have another question. Um, again, from, uh, from Bucharest, uh, the question is, what about a combination of treatments of time or time between treatments? Um, of course, you can always look at combinations of treatment also, um, especially in rare diseases, but also in common diseases. Uh, nowadays, many patients have combinations of treatments, and uh, preferably uh, the time periods between treatments should be as low as possible. Um, uh, <clears throat> and also the time between treatments, yeah, well, that's uh, that's also as low, as low as possible, and so this can all, all be used as indicators for, of quality of care. I think this question is also related to the guidelines, what is said in the, in the guidelines. Okay, you can also look at, for example, when the guideline says there should be given six chemotherapy uh, uh, cycles, for example, then you, can, you could look at are those six cycles being given or not, or did treatment stop after three, three cycles? So you can look at all kinds of indicators related to treatment. Uh, when we go on to uh, slide 23, um, at this moment, uh, cancer registries that are being involved in the Rare Care Net project are now trying to collect data uh, on uh, the four uh, high resolution studies that were already mentioned. Um, we made up our, ourselves some, some points that, uh, that should be for registries at, with some more attention and uh, perhaps uh, the audience has more questions about uh, those high resolution studies. Uh, for, for sarcomas, it is very important that there is a correct classification, so that is really essential in the registration of, of those diseases. Um, okay, oh. we, are, we are trying to speak louder. Sorry. Um, so, um, a spice, a, a, Apart from said that the, the correct classification is very relevant in sarcomas, the grading is also essential for diagnosis. Uh, so uh, when the registration of um, sarcomas is being done, the classification and the exact grading should be very, uh, are very essential. Another point that is related to treatments and the type of treatments is whether there's a, sar a sarcoma as a deep sarcoma or a superficial sarcoma, uh, because su superficial sarcomas uh, often have uh, different treatments and uh, a smaller surgery can be uh, applied to those tumors. Uh, essential that um, a distinction is being made to deep and sub Uh, we go on to slide 24. There are also some special attention remarks on testicular cancers. Uh, like sarcomas, the morphology is essential because you, uh, the seminomas and the non-seminoma germ cell tumors are treated different, uh, especially as far as the adjuvant treatment is concerned. Uh, Possibly a, a difficult topic may be uh, the coding of the, uh, the serum tumor markers. Um, in fact, uh, when uh, the serum tumor markers may be very high before surgery, but after surgery they are uh, often declining, and the lowest value after surgery is. Uh, in the testicular cancer high resolution study, we will also look at recurrence and when should the recurrence be uh, recorded? That is when, uh, the, after the, the first treatment, 
and uh, the following adjuvant treatment, the patient is without residual disease. Then after that period, a recurrence occurs, then you can count it as a recurrence. On slide 25, there are some uh, points of attention for the jet nets, um, like in sarcomas, the grading is really essential in jet nets because low-grade tumors are different than uh, high-grade tumors. Hormonal treatments are often uh, applied to low-grade tumors, not to high-grade tumors, so uh, correction, correct grading uh, uh, is essential. Um, in the protocol, uh, we also ex excluded one group of tumors, that are the carcinoids of the appendix. Well, we excluded those tumors in the protocol because uh, they uh, um, behave clinically benign in the large majority, majority of cases, so, and they are treated completely different from other carcinoids, uh, let's say in the lung or in the pancreas or in the bowels, so that's why we, uh, we Slide 6, there are also some points about the ten, uh, attention of the head and neck tumors. Uh, of course, we, uh, we code all the treatment that is related to those tumors. Uh, treatment may be uh, uh, dependent on the site of the tumor, the exact site of the tumor, so that's why it's really essential to code exactly the, the, sur the site and the sub-site of the tumor. That may, may be rather difficult for uh, registrations. Our advice is to use the clinical opinion as much as possible. They have seen the patient, they have watched all the diagrams, the ichthors, and etc., MRI or CT scans, so they, they, have, they know the, the exact site of the tumor, so use it as much as possible. Slide 27 uh, gives an overview of what we expect uh, to be an outcome. Uh, we hope that, uh, that the combined data that we have from our registry can give an overview of, uh, of the available centers of expertise, those specific uh, rare tumors that we collect the data on, and um, we hope that it may act as an example also for other rare tumors that we did not collect uh, information on, but you could be, uh, could be uh, acted at the same way as, uh, as the tumors that we collected. Maybe even for rare diseases at large. Yes, but perhaps even so, yes. Um, there is still some time for questions. We have ten, ten minutes uh, left, so if people have uh, uh, some more questions, you, you, you do have time. We can now go to slide 29. Yeah, those are the take-home messages. Uh, to conclude and to end this uh, presentation and this uh, session, but please continue sending us uh, your questions. Take home messages. Rare tumors cover about 22% of all tumors diagnosed. Lower survival in patients with rare cancers in, in, in comparison with non-rare cancers or common cancers. Centers or networks of expertise should be put in place to overcome the common challenges as presented. Indicators for identifying centers of or networks of expertise should be developed using a multidisciplinary setting. Well, here we, we will finish our uh, presentation and this session. And if there are no more questions, then we give back the floor to uh, the European School of Oncology. Well, thank you for attending this session.